Welcome everybody to another Creative Zone webinar in collaboration with the Dubai Business Women Council. This is part of the She Leads Initiative, an initiative to accelerate and incubate 100 led women entrepreneurs. Today, today's topic is delivering a differentiated customer experience. And we have Edward Matti with us, the managing partner of CCM Consultancy. CCM Consultancy is a, uh, is a Dubai based consultancy firm with more than 10 years of experience in the market. And I've known Edward for many years. He, he specializes on customer experience, cultural transformation, and many, many others. Edward, thank you so much for taking the time and, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Lorenzo. I appreciate the invitation and uh, being here with everybody trying to share some insights. Thank you. So I understand that you have, quite a, uh, you have a few slides to share with us as part of the discussion of today. So go ahead, share your screen and let's get right to it and tell us a little bit about what is it that we're gonna be discussing today. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, recognizing that this is an enormous topic. But what I'm hoping to do by the end of today um, is give you an idea of some of the trends that are going on, something to be mindful of of what's out there in the market on customer experience, uh, differentiated customer experience. And at the same time, we're going to talk about what you can do or what you ought to be doing. And there'll be a few steps to that as well. Um, so it's a little bit more than just the trends out there, but hopefully some actionable items that you'll be able to take with you as well. Um, if we talk about this, and there's a reason I'm very passionate about this, I think a lot of business entrepreneurs, when they get started, they recognize that business is about people, and it very much so is. And then we start to look at what's that product or that service that we're offering. And then we look at the process that we want to deliver it. And what we need to focus on is that the one commonality that all of this is, how do we keep our client or our customer in the middle of all of this and ensure that product process and people are aligned? Now, to put this into perspective, you have to recognize there are different business strategies. There's a differentiated business, there's a commoditized business, and then there's a low and high cost. If we fit into a differentiated business, it can't be low cost and differentiated. It's very challenging to be able to do that. Similarly, we can't charge a high cost for something that's commoditized. Um, but of course, we can be commodity and low cost where we've got a scale of economies, we've got input costs and distribution that keeps us uh, in business for a very long time. Where businesses differentiate themselves is that high cost, that unique experience where our people bring it to life and there's genuinely a brand experience that comes out there. And we know from years and years of this that this has to be done in a particular way. I often talk about something called karaoke capitalism. Um, and, and to describe this, and, and we can put this out if you'd like to the chat room, uh, what, what does this look like to most people? And please feel free to drop in in, your, in the chat box what you think this is. It looks and like Lorenzo a, can keep me, like a keep lab, me posted. Yeah. A lab. People comment on the, on the chat. You have the two options of the chat, the live chat or the Q&A box. Go ahead and share your, your thoughts. Apple Store, somebody's saying, yeah. looks a bit like a lab of, of today's world in a bit where there is a screen, webinars maybe being projected, meeting rooms. So this is actually a bank. And this bank was so keen on, on they, they looked at the Apple Store and they said, my goodness, look at this and how busy it is. And you've got the Genius Bar and so on. And they went out and they hired a, a, an architectural firm that can design a similar scenario to that. Now, when I walk into a bank, that's not what I anticipate to see. So immediately, we've got to recognize that when it comes to a differentiated customer experience, this is what we call karaoke capitalism. And we've all been to probably a karaoke bar or have heard of one. The reality is, if you were a phenomenal singer, you wouldn't be at a karaoke bar. You would be uh, in, in cl claiming your fame and, and, and out there and, and, and on the charts and so on. And the same thing happens in business where we're trying to sing every, somebody else's song and we usually do it poorly. So the reality is when it comes to customer experience, it's about singing our own song brilliantly. It's not about copying others or looking what's out there and say, my goodness, I wanna do that. We wanna make sure that we find our uniqueness that create, creates that brand experience for people. And we know that the numbers, the financials back this up. Time and again, every study shows that companies that excel at a service experience, that customer experience, whether it's a profit per employee, their road to their net margins, everything is significantly higher when they're focused on delivering a great customer experience. And we've got tons of these numbers to back this up. We're not gonna get into this today though. 
I want to talk about the trends that are out there in differentiated customer experience before we talk about what can some of those that are on today's call uh, uh, be able to do. The first one is what we refer to as imagination. Companies are trying to find how can I connect to the imagination of, of, of our individuals. Apple is an organization that's done that for years. They try to see things from the user experience, try to create that, whether it's in, in their stores, their products, whatever it might be. It's trying to help us through the imagination process. They don't leave anything to chance. Many of us would be more familiar possibly even with Ikea. And I don't know about you, Lorenzo, but if you've ever been into an Ikea shop, I have never walked in and only bought what I was there for. The mm -hmm. fact of the matter is they realized that we don't need to make sure that people use their own imagination. We're going to create our, their own, that we're going to create imagination for them. And they set up their, their shop like a, a, your bedroom or your dining room or your kitchen. And you walk around and say, you know, that lamp would actually look good in my bedroom. I kind of have the same setup. So they've worked through that imagination process for us. Uh, and that's been a very big differentiator. So one of the elements of those trends is how do we make sure that we access the mind, the customer's imagination? Do we build it for them or do we let it float out there so they can feel that we've got something that is unique that we're offering them? A second and a very big trend that's out there is trust. So much so that we're seeing even peer-to-peer -peer lending. I'll give an example here of banking. Banks have lost the trust of customers so much that I'm willing to borrow money from a complete stranger on these platforms, maybe halfway across the world. And that person halfway across the world is willing to lend me money when they don't necessarily know me. And this has come out because trust in the brand and in the offering has become so big. So while for many people say, well, of course, that's natural. Not really. People need to feel that it's a trusted brand, that they can count on you. There's a reputation behind it. Even when, I, when you're a startup or a young business, that's what they're looking for. And whether you do that by keeping your word, your promises, by delivering above and beyond, all of these build up trust in that, that bank uh, that we have with our customers. And it becomes a very important factor that's there. Um, another one is uh, you, we take the example of Starbucks. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a fan of Starbucks coffee, and I know that might upset some people on the call, but Starbucks did not become famous because their coffee was so absolutely amazing. They found a way to relate to the customer and to build that trusting relationships. They were definitely someone we can depend on. Um, their hours were there. Their people were jovial. They were laughing. The writing of the name and calling out your name gave us this warm and fuzzy feeling that it's a familiar place. And there's nothing greater than when you're waiting at the end of the counter and they call up the name Edward and you're like, yeah, that's my cup of coffee. This was made specifically for me. And that built up that trust bank with customers that kept coming back and coming back over and over again, thus leading to thousands upon thousands of shops. And that's not where they started. So that kind of gives us also hope that doing it right has a very, makes, a, makes a very big difference in the experience that we're offering. Now, the other one is co-creation. And this is an area that I think a lot of entrepreneurs are very afraid of taking that step into. And that's the notion of co-creating the experience we want with our customers. In fact, in some of the instances when we do our customer experience consulting, we invite customers and employees into the room, or even if it's a startup, it's just me. Uh, we get into the same room and we co-create. We find out what are their expectations. And there's examples of this all over the market. And this is one of my favorite. It's a bit of an old one. Um, uh, this is a, a little child who, who asked their parent to write into Sainsbury's in the UK and ask, why is tiger bread called that when it actually looks like giraffe bread? Um, sure enough, Sainsbury's actually thanked the, 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 the kid and their parents, of course, sent them a little gift card. And they actually started to name their product Sainsbury's giraffe bread and then tiger bread in bracket. This is when we recognize that companies are not just listening to the customer, but they're actually acting on it. And then we go into this co-creation. Are we seeing our experience and our product and our service from our customer's eyes? Or are we so focused and happy with what we're offering that we tend to shut everything else out? Um, and there's tons of opportunities for this where we can sit down um, in, in, in workshop style, invite your customers, talk to them about the journey. And it's amazing what insight you would get out of there. We've done this with the British Airport Authority and many other companies where we help them create that by that co-creation process. I want to talk about beyond traditional spaces. And for those of us that are in smaller businesses out there on the call today, this might resonate a little bit more. 
Today, the customer is no longer looking for the traditional office space, the traditional retail space, or whatever it might be. We're looking for things that have gone beyond. We're seeing pop-ups become so popular. Um, they're easier. They're less expensive. It allows us to showcase a product or an offering or service in a different environment. And people are getting extremely creative with that. In fact, this is what you're looking at here. And I don't know if any of our callers uh, today, the, the, our participants, can recognize this. Lorenzo, any idea what this might be? Uh, looks like a bit of a Nike shop, but uh, there is a Puma. Yeah, it's a Puma shop. This is very good. It is a Puma shop, and Puma recognized that the fact of the matter. Most of their uh, their 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 shoppers are young millennials. They they were the social experience, the group dynamic that's there. So the store became largely a social setting more than it was a shoe shop or clothing shop. And that started to attract more and more people. And Puma now is on, on, well, was on track until earlier this year to transform every store worldwide into this kind of setup here, where they're creating this experience that goes beyond the traditional spaces. We've seen this in subway or metro stations where now you can do your groceries by scanning the pictures that are on there um, and then simply setting it to the app and it arrives at your home um, upon arrival. In fact, uh, two of the airports in the United Kingdom have it in the airport for arrivals. This way you scan your shopping cart, the goods, the essentials that you need. By the time you get home, you've got everything to stack up your fridge when you're back from your vacation or your travels. So we've gone beyond traditional spaces and we're recognizing that there's got to be a more unique way to reach out to our customers. It is no longer in the office or in the retail or mall or whatever else it might be. Now, another element is using technology. And while this is nothing new, of course, it's been taken to a whole other level right now. In fact, when you think about this, when we talk about technology, we're seeing this in many restaurants today. Uh, we're using tablets for our menus, for ordering and so on. But we've gone as far now as the touchless trial experience. We're seeing stores now change from uh, the traditional going into the changing room uh, to put on the item, but rather now you can select the item select the size and within standing behind the screen, you can find out how it looks on you without touching. And you can only imagine over the last five or six months, companies are accelerating the installation of this item in their stores. Um, it's happening across Europe, it's happening in North America and a couple of places in, in, in Asia, we're seeing that change. How much more technology can we bring forward um, into the organization or into the offering that we have? Another element that's there is the importance of stories. And I think for those of us that are, I noticed some of you wrote down in the, in the chat box that uh, you're just about to launch, you're starting. I think this is one of the trends that becomes probably your most important one to focus on early on. And that's the importance of stories. And it's about creating a story for yourself. And I'm gonna give a couple of large examples, but then I'll relate it back to more of an entrepreneurial element. British Airways set out a few years ago, we helped them with the first class experience on how do you create a story behind that. It wasn't about an airline, it wasn't about that I've spent money on first class, but there was a story to everything that's there. That means that when you sat down, they can tell you a story about where the leather that's on their seats came from and what particular farm area and where are they getting it in Denmark. When they talked about the cheeses that they were serving, they could tell you what was there, um, what kind of cheeses and why they're paired with certain areas and so on. And the why is that every single thing had a story. And that's what people buy into. In fact, even Miele, the, the, the appliance store does the same thing. And they talk about their start, their, their beginnings and why their dishwasher is so quiet. Now, it's a dishwasher. But for a lot of people, it's not about the quiet. It's about being engaged in the startup and where these ideas came about. And the reason I said earlier that entrepreneurs have an opportunity here to really focus in on this is because the reality is to differentiate yourself in a very crowded marketplace, no matter what it is that you're doing. I saw agency on there. I saw coaching. There's a number of businesses that are on the call today. It's about the differentiation and it's the story that's going to make that difference. And if you're able to document your story and create that experience as your business grows and you add more and more employees, you're able to share that story with them so they can carry it on. So when we talked about the three P's earlier, our product, people, and, and, and process, people have to be your representatives, your people. And th those are the stories that come to life. And that's what people are buying into. I'm going to talk about behavioral economics. And I think this is a big one because it impacts us in just about everywhere. 
Today, behavioral economics is one of the biggest areas that's being studied in customer experience. Whether it's the lineups and the long lines that we're in and what happens in there, companies are going out of their way. And one of the earliest companies that has documented this, um, I think back about 20 some odd years ago was Disney. When Disney opened up their, their, uh, uh, their parks, they started to look at behavioral economics how long it takes in line, uh, they would tell you, and I'm sure we've all been there in a theme park where it says 30 minutes uh, wait time from here. It's actually 38, it, it's actually 25 minutes, but they make you feel that, wow, it moved a lot faster. We're seeing even businesses, uh, buildings that add elevators into their office space. It gives us the, 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 the feeling that we're not alone in there and there's a social uh, element that comes out there. So behavioral economics is making in way, its way in every business. For those of you that are starting up, the way you answer the phone if you're getting calls, the speed of, of, of response time on your website uh, uh, inquiries, um, your application run, run capacity, all of these lead themselves to behavioral economics. The perception that people have. There was a study recently done on, on this by Deloitte that said that uh, uh, customers they, upon visiting a new website will determine within about the eight, the first eight to 12 seconds, whether or not they want to stay on that website. That's the upload speed that they get the information on the front page, uh, the landing page, I should say, all of that information, the engagement, the visual dynamics, all of that is assessed within that first eight to 12 seconds. And they make a decision whether or not they want to pursue this further. So that tells us that again, the behavior component of our customer is so important because that will dictate the level of engagement that we have with them. And it's something that we really have to keep in mind. Now, when it comes to that, I'm gonna talk about this last piece of it. And I think this one, it comes naturally to people, but businesses are reluctant to do it. And that's the random acts of kindness. And there's countless examples of this here. I'm gonna talk about a particular example. And that comes from, uh, done a few years ago by Virgin America Flight 837 where it was, it was the holidays and they simply left a tiny gift on every single passenger's seat. This absolutely delighted the, the, the passengers at that point in time. And there was no reason for it. They picked a random flight and they've done this over and over again. Now for the entrepreneur, it is looking for those differentiated moments. It's recognizing your customers. And there was something that Lorenzo and I were talking about before we kicked off the session is how do you maintain that? You cannot do something that is a, considered a random act of kindness that beyond that is not sustainable down the road. And you only do it once and you don't do it again. It, becomes, it cheapens the act itself. So we look at businesses that have done this on an ongoing basis, be it a gift voucher, be it a complimentary session, be it something that they feel they're giving back for absolutely no reason. It is an unbelievable, it has an unbelievable impact on people because they feel that you're caring at a different level. And it ought to be random, different points in time. Um, businesses do this on an ongoing basis. For some businesses, it's become a process. Um, Zappos.com in the United States, probably one of the most famous companies for customer experience. Early, early on in the difficult times, challenging financial times, they decided that their differentiator is going to be the speed of delivery of the products that are, that are ordered, be it online or their telephone line. And they decided that they would always promise customers that they're going to get their product within 48 hours. But because of the deals that they had done in shipping and so on, they, had get, they would be able to, that if an order comes in before 12 o'clock on a particular day, they would have same day delivery. And then if it came in a little bit after, it'll be next day. And that surprised all of their customers. They actually delighted them that they received it earlier than expected. And we all know how we feel when we receive a package at home of something that we've ordered. Um, so this here is, again, uh, it's a become a, a trend now because it's a differentiator and more and more businesses are looking for these acts of kindness that they can apply there. I'm going to pause for any questions that might be coming through or comments, uh, uh, Lorenzo, and then we can have a chat before I talk about what can we do about all of these trends. That's excellent, Edward. Thank you for, for that. Maybe go back to the slide where you have the eight trends. I, I like to make a few references to this. And there, yes, invite some of you to start putting your questions. The first thing that comes to my mind is if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm looking at these eight trends that you're listing here, which are brilliant, I think, could we suggest that then an entrepreneur should go out now and do a bit of an inventory analysis of saying, where do I stand as a company with these eight trends? Am I dealing, how am I dealing with imagination? How am I dealing with trust? And what is the trust that I'm creating? 
with my with my clients. So perhaps this could be a good exercise that the startups and the entrepreneurs can go back, look inwards and say, and draw all these things. And also especially say, where is it that you would like to be? How you are going to improve the importance of stories or the random act of kindness? What is that you can do? Any ideas on that, Edward? I think that you, you, you've hit it dead on, Lorenzo. I think for a lot of entrepreneurs or startups, the biggest challenge or the biggest barrier or obstacle is the one that they put there themselves, where they start to refer to themselves, but I'm just a startup. Um, I'm just getting going and, and I'm not there yet. Um, you know, of course, it's the old adage, think big and, and think into the future. And I think that the, the more that an entrepreneur or a startup can get things right and get things in place early on, the more appreciative their customers are going to be because it's, not, it's no longer a hit and miss. You're no longer uh, trying it when you get big enough or when you have enough customers, you're trying it from the get-go. And I think an inventory, as you put it, is a very nice idea where you can cross-check where am I in my business against this, these eight trends or where do I want to be against these eight trends and when? Is it in 18 months? Is it in, two, in, in five years? And have a plan for that. We really have to start to think much bigger. I know that sometimes the world of entrepreneurship is a little bit intimidating. And, and I have to commend anybody who's on the call who's already taken the first step. That usually tends to be the toughest one to determine that I want to move into an entrepreneurial role. I want to start up a business, but it doesn't stop there. While you should be commended for taking that first step, it's about how do you think about the future and where your business is going to be 5, 10, 20 years from now. Good, good. There's a few good questions coming in. And please, I encourage all of you to put your questions that relate to these eight trends and this topic. Uh, Anupama says, hi, Edward, I'm into B2B business. Which of these eight trends matter the most when you are in this B2B type of industry? That's a great question. And I think a few of them apply there. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, the importance of stories. Customers, clients buy into stories. And there's a very, very simple reason for it. It is one of the earliest experiences we've had. For those of you that were children or have children, you would remember that if you were a child, it was your parents reading to you stories, at the bed, whether it's bedtime or different times, or even in school. And today, we do that with our kids. You're reading stories to them. You're building up that imagination process. That's the buy-in. Um, we, we, in fact, we've got an entire workshop called the, 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 the art of story selling, uh, because it is, that's what people want to buy into. They want the big picture. They want that imagination drawn up there. And I think that's the thing that we have to get right. And I'll tell you, as we grow as a business, particularly in B2B, we forget that when we're in there with a meeting, whether, whether you know, you're an account manager or you're dealing with, uh, uh, with purchasers or, or, or the buyers on, on, on the, on the client side. While, of course, they want to buy your technical specs and all of the details, but they want to buy something bigger. They want to buy into that entire story. That's what they're believing in. So to me, that's a very big one. On the B2B side, also, the notion of trust uh, becomes a very important one because we really have to build that. It could take us years to build trust and seconds to break it. And today, even more so when it comes to the online, uh, the, the online access and, and you see it. Something goes wrong, we take to Twitter, we take to Instagram, we take to Facebook to uh, shame the company, write a negative review and so on. So trust and building that reputation becomes just as important in my opinion. Um, so if I had to really zero in on a couple, those would be two elements when it comes to B2B. Excellent. Another good question from Heidi. She says, do we need to be doing all of them at the same time or is it about choosing the ones that resonate the most with us? You know, the one thing about entrepreneurs and, and, and startups is uh, early on, you're the jack of all trades. Uh, I remember when I started the business, I used to say, look, uh, you know, I, I'm the GM, um, I'm the marketing guy, I'm finance, I'm the, I'm the janitor, I'm cleaning up my office. We do all of these things. And, and there's a lot to take in. And that, it's a simple fact that there's so much going on in our lives as we build up a business and we keep growing. And um, our first hire is usually a, a very intimidating process because it's somebody else that's coming into our world. And then of course, it starts, there's a domino effect that's there. I don't necessarily think that you need to consider all of them and say, well, what do I have in technology? What do I have a trust? What am I doing for behavioral economics? But I think it is recognizing that there are trends out there. And, in some cases, one of these trends could be the make or break or the differentiator in your market. 
It could be the fact that for those of you that might be B2C, it's the beyond traditional space. You found a different way to engage people. It could be that sense of imagination or technology driven. Um, so I would find what makes sense for you, keeping in mind that there are trends out there and then looking at what can I implement today? What should I be considering in six months or 12 months and so on? Um, but one of the important elements and I'm going to talk about that later on is the customer experience is not a static experience. And I'll explain that later. I'll explain why later on. Um, so we have to constantly revisit and see how can I further improve that as I move along. One more before you move to the next topic. It says, Daniela is asking, six months into the pandemic, there's a new space that has become highly saturated, the web. How to stand out among so many webinars, e-commerce sites, live Instagram stories? How do we differentiate ourselves among this? So again, I think a, a very, very good question. And, and Daniela is absolutely right. It is unbelievably overcrowded these days and, and everything is at our fingertips. While it always was, Today, we're sitting around, work from home, whatever it might be. We feel like we shouldn't go out or can't go out, and we have to get out there and, and, and find the information that we're looking for. I think, again, it's about that, that user interface. Uh, people are looking for, and I, again, going back to that study from Deloitte on that 8 to 12 second marker, uh, people today, they're receiving an invitation and it's a, you know, a, for, for a webinar or an, 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 an online series or anything of the sort. If it's not speaking to them, the visual dynamics, the sense of imagination, that allure, uh, the ease of technology and connectivity, the story behind it, we're not, we're not willing to, to remain engaged. Um, so it is about that differentiation and, and looking at, can I do something different that stands out? Am I on, a, uh, am I on the, 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 auto, the autoplay of, of my, my email campaigns, my newsletter? I'm just hitting go and, and getting to it. I've got to be able to change that to stand out there. And I think if I, if I want to really point out to a uniqueness in, in, in differentiation, co-create. Rather than trying to figure out what people want in the market and get thrown into a saturated market, ask, run a poll, invite customers and clients, say, look, we'd love to find out what you'd be interested in. We're hosting a session about you. And I think you would get a lot more interaction and feedback from something like that rather than trying to throw things at, the, at a dartboard and hoping that something sticks. Excellent. We'll let you move along with the presentation. I mean, on this issue of creating content and being different, I just, it comes to my mind about a week or two weeks ago, this, this post of this guy, I think his Instagram um, tag is uh, dog face. And is this guy going down a street on his skateboard drinking a, a bottle of juice? I don't know if you've seen this, He's yeah. gone viral all over the world. And, and this just shows, I think it has never been easier than now, the possibility of reaching out to people in such ways uh, with, with simple content. Anyhow, I just wanted to put that out. Uh, it, 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 it's a very good point, Lorenzo. I, mean, I can use some of my team members as examples where maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago, we, I would have never dared ask them about content creation for online and so on. Uh, but they found new skills within themselves because there's so many platforms that make it easy. Uh, there's ways to learn that and, and, and differentiate and create those uniquenesses. And I know that David, uh, David was on, I think, last week from Edelman, David Bikazi. Uh, he addressed this notion of that brand experience and that, that sense of uniqueness, which becomes so important. Excellent. So now let me leave you with a few points here on what you can do about all of this and and maybe this will, will help that rather than focus on the uh the trends that are out there it's like can we look inwards to our business and what do we need to do and there's a three-part process that we talk about it is the discover develop and deliver these are the three d's of differentiated customer experience for us and if we're able to do that we can get things right and the reason we talk about these areas is so many clients, when they come to us, they jump straight to deliver. Say, look, but I need to get to market. Yeah, that's great. But that's so, so short term. You're going to get it done and you might make some money doing so also. But there are other steps that you can do ahead of time so you can get this right. So when we talk about this notion of discover, now, no matter how big or small your business is, there's one thing I would tell you. Let me just get rid of a few things here is what we call in the discovery phase, the culture mirror. Where are we now from organization to employee, whether you're one or 10 and the customer's point of view. And this is where we need to kind of get into a sense of honesty with ourselves and get real and recognize 
truly where we are and, and where our culture is. For many people, and I can tell you, I've done this with a very large organization. I asked them, what's their culture? And they have a very hard time describing it for me. And that's a problem. And when they finally do, I often ask, is that what you want it to be? And often it's not because they haven't necessarily sat there and said, look, you know, we need an honesty conversation or a transparent conversation amongst us to recognize where we are and is this really where we want to be? And these happen through, of course, surveys, whether within the organization or out and an assessment of the experience that you have. For some of you, you're hiring your first and second employee and tell me, Edward, we're so tiny, we can all fit into one room. It doesn't matter. Your culture starts at the very beginning. And we have to be able to define that through our values and subsequently the behaviors and the culture that we want to build and we've got to get it right. And it starts from day one. What you hold true and valuable to you today will stay with you for a very long time. It might, it might, it might evolve, but it stays with you for a very long time earlier on. This is an important one, particularly for those young entrepreneurs or the, up, the, 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 the startups, customer profiling. Sit down and figure out what does your customer look like? And I'm not saying customer A is this and customer B is that. I'll tell you what we do. We actually name our customers. So for example, Muhammad is a 44 year old uh, a purchaser at this company or a head of HR at that company and so on. Uh, typically he looks for this, he enjoys that. We build up full customer profiles. And this way, when we're even speaking as a team, we say, you know, uh, this person is Muhammad. And my team can immediately say, oh, yes, okay, this is the kind of the, the, the profile that they've got. And you can do that. I saw a variety of businesses that were popping up in the chat box. Profile your customers, get a clear picture of who they are, include realistic details about their lifestyle and their habits. That makes them more human and it allows us to interact. So when we're people, our people see this and they, they see the customer perspective, they create and deliver experiences that matter to them. And that's, I think, something that's really important for us to do. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a company that we worked with. This is going back about nine years now, so it's a little while. And what we did here is uh, it was for a, a grocery store, um, and we created a profile of somebody named Frances. And Frances is a mother of two. Uh, she was a working mom. Now she's staying at home with the kids and so on, married with this. this and we created the entire profile. And the slogan became for the team members, are you fit for Francis? And that meant that the team, every time they put on their uniform, every time they got ready for work, they had to look at themselves and say, you know, am I fit for Francis? If Francis likes this, 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 and this, am I ready to receive her and her family and be able to serve her and so on? And I think for a lot of us, when we start to think that way and we through the proper profiling, and you can have multiple customer profiles, you're not serving only one profile, we could start looking inwards and recognize what should my service look like? What should my product offering look like? What should my website look like or my application or whatever it might be, how you're reaching your customers? I think a very big element is the experience mapping. And I can tell you this is an area I, I cannot stress enough. Map your customer experience even when you don't have a single customer. Pretend you're the customer. See everything from their eyes and sit down and say, listen, if, I, if, my, if my business is a web-based business and they get on my website, how many clicks till they get to there? How will they find me? What will they be feeling? Are they looking for me via their mobile phone or is it on a desktop, um, a, a browser? A, are they sitting at home or in the office or in the, are, are, are they in, in a cab ride? We've got to really look at that. And the experience is it, it allows us to identify all of the touch points. But there are two touch points. And most of us don't do the second one. We do the functional one. They, they clicked here, they got to this part, I sold them this, I send them the product, but there's an emotional experience also. And this is the area we have to map as well. And we've got to get this right to make sure that if we're going to en enhance our customer experience, we can focus our energies on these touch points to make the difference. And this is an example of some of our experience mapping. Um, these can be as long as four, five, six meters, uh, depending on the number of touch points that there are. Uh, we map every single emotional component, the functional component, the highs, the lows that are there. We study this and we're able to then recreate an experience that is truly differentiated for the customer, particularly where we feel there are lows rather than highs. And I often remind people that if I wanted to study the habits of a lion, I can go to the zoo and do so, or I can go out into the wild. So I urge entrepreneurs, startups, go out into the wild. See the business as your customers see it. It's not under a magnifying glass as an observation, but rather uh, reenact the experience that you're going to go through. Invite some of your friends or family members to go through that 
and let them give you honest feedback. And you can go through that customer experience mapping, that journey mapping uh, through them. It doesn't have to be with existing customers if you're just starting out. Now, on the develop phase, I would urge you, for those of you that even if you have one or two or 10 or 50 customers, bring a couple of them together, sit down with them if you're, if you're a sole proprietor or it's just you in the business right now. If you've got a couple of frontline sp staff, bring them in also and sit down and talk about what do you expect from the business. Let them throw out as crazy ideas as there could be. And I can tell you, we've seen some, some immensely crazy ones. In fact, um, one of our partner businesses in the UK, uh, we, we did a, only a portion of the project. We were, we were uh, subcontracted for this uh, with Eurostar, uh, the, the train. We realized when we sat the customers down, they said, look, we never go to the cart to buy our, 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 uh, our coffee, our tea, or our sandwiches, because on the train in, in Europe, I don't want to leave my, my bags unattended. I'm afraid. Uh, so they recreated how can you SMS the bar or the, or the cart to order your food in there and so on. And this idea came from a customer, a regular user of the train. So it is unbelievable what you can come up with with ideas from your customers rather than creating them yourselves. So invo involve people at this stage to get buy-in, to change and real engagement with customers. Um, it is amazing what can come out of what we call co-creation experiences. Beyond that, make it fun if you're doing that, put out some pa paper and pen and colors. And even if you've got Lego mini people, just sit down and have fun with your customers. I can guarantee you that in of itself as a session, and nowadays virtual we're doing them, um, will create a unique experience for people and a very memorable brand experience, which is exactly what you want to do. Now, here's a, an area that we talked about earlier on in the development is the story development. It is about bringing the customer experience alive for everyone in the organization. And I urge you, document it. I can tell you, I failed at this in the very, very early stages of the business. When I started up as a one-man band, I didn't. Say, I, I have some wonderful stories of how we came about. I have some great stories about how we grew. But we only started documenting this about 18 months into the business. We were offering the advice, but we were not taking it ourselves. And we started to document all of the stories, how we came about um, from where our big early beginnings, humble beginnings are to where we came today, um, why we decided to expand into, into North America, into New York, Montreal, Toronto, and so on. And there's a buildup that's there. And today, I'm very thankful for that because this story that we have, or a number of those stories, we're able to pass them on to our employees as part of our onboarding process. And I can tell you, if you don't do this early enough, when you start to grow and add more and more employees, you're scrambling to onboard. Every business, SME, that I've often talked to say, oh my goodness, I'm having a hard time. We didn't document this. And so we documented processes, but we didn't document the story that we have. And that's really what comes to life. So we've got to really focus on that and make sure our people really understand the big picture when it comes to this. So develop that, document it, make it into a beautiful artwork and piece that's out there. Uh, this is from our work a few years ago with Malaysian Airlines. Um, we, we, we designed their, their, their experience for business class, and we documented every single step of the journey from people booking to showing up to the airport to boarding. All of that stuff was in there um, that we're able to share with people. And develop your standards. And we talked about this very, very early on, uh, Lorenzo and I, when we were talking. Um, there has to be a consistency to this here. If we don't get this part right, it is we will fail because we will develop a high early on when we're a smaller business dealing with 10, 20, 30 customers, we manage the standards, but then it starts to drop as we grow and, and we've got economies of scale and we're simply not keeping up to that there. Um, document those details, the what, the why, the how, the who, all of these are important elements. And I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but measuring and performance management becomes very important when it comes to this here. Um, but I'll touch on that in, in another element that's there when we deliver. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this here. We, we've really inundated you with, with, with the standards development and the experience that you can put on there. The delivering. Whether you have one, two or 10 or 50 people, or you continue to grow every single part of the team has a role to play in. It's our responsibility to engage. I often meet business owners that tell me, but Edward, um, that's what I hire for. They need to be able to come and be excited. Not at all. The responsibility still falls on the business owner or the entrepreneur, whatever you might be. It is our job to inspire teams, to get them excited, jump out of bed and say, my goodness, I am so thankful that I've joined this team. And I can tell you several of the team members that have been with us seven or eight years, it's come from exactly that. They bought into the big picture. 
not because they loved necessarily the day one that they were here, but it was the entire experience that was created. And it's about that inspiration that's there. People end up feeling motivated, supported, valued, and recognized by their managers, by the customers, everybody. And we know that at the end of the day, as you grow, you can no longer be everywhere at the same time. Your people are your representatives, your brand ambassadors in the market with your customers. And that motivation and engagement and inspiration, that's who has to carry it through for you. And it's our job to be able to do so. When we finally get this done, and again, this is an area, I talked about this earlier. We do it, we said it, we say, fantastic. We're not done. We've got to track the experience. We have to review it and measure it. We've got to make sure that what's working stays and what's not is replaced. And that comes through customer, employee, commercial, and operational measures, not just one. A lot of people tell me, well, Edward, I'm doing a customer satisfaction survey. That's very nice, but what about your internal customer, your employees? What about the commercials? You might be giving great service, but you're losing money doing so, or your operation is not efficient. We have to be able to do that as well. And if we embed a culture of measurement into the business, I think it dramatically changes um, everything that's going on in there. So a few things that, that happen there. Um, and I know this is done to death, but for those of you that are starting out, if you're able to do this early on, understand that the net promoter score is probably one of the most uh, widely used measures for customer experience or customer satisfaction. And it is only those that give you a nine or 10 that are considered promoters. Now, I know you recognize this from customer satisfaction surveys that you filled out when you were a customer somewhere. And that's a very important element that's there because you know that sometimes if it, if it didn't wow you, you're very reluctant to put a nine or a 10, you might give a seven or an eight. You're, for, for, for the company, you're considered a passive customer. And that's why we have to get our, our uh, deliverables right because we want promoters, we want our customers to confidently say nine and 10. And if they're a seven or eight, we've got some serious work to do. I know businesses say, well, you know, eight's not too bad. No, it's actually pretty bad. We've got to move towards up that, that on there. So I'm going to give you one last piece on, on this element here in delivery, and that's what the balance scorecard looks like. I said there are four areas, the first of which is efficiency measures. That's call, for those of you, for some of you, it's call performance. It's wait time in queues. It's website or app responsiveness. These are all efficiency measures of your business that you have to be truly honest with yourself and continue to track how well you're doing here. For some of you, it'll, you have to look at the commercial measures. Has there been an increase in ancillary revenue? Is there an increased basket size if you're selling B2C or anything of the sort? B2B, it's repeat purchases. Are clients coming back? Are they referring business to you? And then as we grow, we have to start to look at other areas. We have to look at our satisfaction measures for the customer. What are our net promoter scores? Are we getting client testimonials? Is there positive online feedback? All of these are part of your scorecard. And last but not least, as you grow, is the engagement measure through your employees. And there's a ratio of engaged employees to disengaged employees. I'm not looking for, you know, what's the blanket, but I want to look at the ratio engaged versus disengaged. I want to look at employee recommendation or referral and feedback. And I want to look at employee ownership of the experience that they deliver. Do, be, do they believe that I have skin in the game? I've been responsible just as much as my boss or the employer or whomever it may be. These are all the measures that we look at for the balanced scorecard. I'm going to pause here for a moment, Lorenzo. I've got a couple of other elements to cover, uh, but I'd love to open it up for any comments or feedbacks or questions. That's excellent. I mean, I think, I think uh, everybody might be feeling the same way that, that I feel right now, which is a lot of good information to take. Uh, as a startup and as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you're looking at these slides and thinking, oh, wow, there's quite a bit that I can look into in terms of the way that I run my business, in terms of the things that I should be looking. There, is, there are four points that I took note that really relate to what I feel to the startups that are in this webinar because of me understanding a little bit of their journey. The three, three four points that I wanted to make is the issue of the customer journey, really understanding what is the customer journey that your clients are going through. Listen to your front line measuring results and at the end of the day that your people are your greatest assets. Um, I want to invite people, yes, to send your questions. Please start putting your comments in the, in the Q&A box or even if you want to share uh, an idea of something that you're going through as a startup. I know that Edward has another section similar to this.
to go. We have another 10 minutes left in the webinar. Please put your questions in. We will address them too. But as I was saying, Edward, to me, those four elements that I was bringing really relate. And I think especially at the beginning of a, of, of, of a startup, its journey, this issue of understanding the customer journey. At the beginning, maybe you don't have a lot of customers to start with. So as you're saying, invite your family, your friends, yeah. and hear and try them out on how will be that experience. Because it's the only way that you're going to be able to start understanding what could be the bottlenecks. What is it that people see value in, et cetera? A hundred percent. And I think this is probably the easiest place to start, Lorenzo. Um, the fact is that many of us can do a, a, a journey map. You don't need experts to do this, uh, particularly for your startup. If you're, you're a one-person operation, um, it's okay. Um, even if you haven't signed up your first customer, I saw somebody uh, in, in, when we first started in the chat box, right, in the process of setting up the business. That's the perfect time. You already, you've made a decision, you're in the process of setting it up, sit down and figure out what does the customer journey look like for you? Whether it's B2B or B2C is not really relevant. There's going to be a customer journey. And we have to sit down and really look at all of the various touch points that are involved. And again, I remind you, you're measuring, the, you're, you're assessing the functional component of the journey and the emotional component, because we are still human beings and we make a lot of decisions on an emotional whim or in various emotional states. Whether they're good or bad states is not relevant, but we're in an emotional state. So we've got to make sure that we pinpoint these areas and then really work backwards from there and say, all right, now that I figured this out, how can I enhance that journey? What are the key touch points that I can make a very big difference very quickly to our, to our customers? Nahid is asking how to build user profiles when you're starting out. You will not have any data so early on. So that's again a good question, but at the same time, I would say, if you've already made a decision to the customer to, to, to start up a business, you probably have a rough idea of who you're going to offer your services to. So it does take a bit of creativity to sit down and say, well, listen, you know, who is my typical customer or typical types of customers that I have, and from there start to build up those profiles. You will be able to amend them. Don't, they're not carved in stone. But as you take one customer and two and 10 and 20, you'll start to get a better idea. In fact, you might even realize, you know what? That's not my market segment. I'm no longer pursuing clients or customers in that, in that category. I'm going after the following. And your profiles will end up changing. So in the early stages, while you don't have a customer to profile, you know what your ideal customer or your typical customer might look like. And you're able to use that to create the profiles. Excellent. We'll let you to your final. Very good. I, and this is really, uh, I want to drive a very particular point home because I think this applies to every business. Um, and I talk about this endlessly. Um, and it is about the levels of get, you know, getting customer experience right. Every business, there's three tiers that we talk about. There is the implicit service, there is the expected service, and then there's what we call the impressed and delighted service. And I'm going to give the most basic example because probably everybody on today's webinar has been in the situation. Before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot. I spent about 160 to 180 days a year on the road in, in the various countries that we, uh, uh, that, that we do business. I visit a lot of clients in Europe and East Asia and so on. And because of that, obviously, I'm in and out of hotels. And for many of you, you recognize you, you know, you, you've done a hotel booking and so on. When I make a hotel booking, I don't think about whether or not there's going to be a TV, a bed, if there's going to be towels in the room, that's implicit for me. It's, 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 not, even, it's not expected, it's implicit. I, I, I don't even give it a second thought. When I'm making my booking, booking, I'm not asking do they have soap or towels in the room. And that's typically, for most of us, there's something of the sort. But for others, then we go into that next level, and that's what we call expected. And this could be a, a, a today in today's world, a satellite wall-mounted TV, uh, the internet access, of course, that's free, uh, a mini bar or the, the coffee facility. Um, I, I can tell you myself, uh, I kind of look for, there's an expectation, there's an espresso machine that's in there. All of these are expectations that we have. And, the, and this determines what, the way the experience go. We measure our experience based on expectation and experience. And where my expectation goes will impact the experience. And a few years ago, uh, this had happened here. And, and I think many of you, uh, I know we're short on time, so I'm not going to ask uh, everybody on the webinar. But for most people, and study after study uh, uh, confirms this, is that 
for most of us, when we get to our hotel room, we might put down our bags. Obviously, if you're in the Middle East, somebody maybe brought them up for you. But one of the very first things we do in our, in our room is we check the bathroom. We have some uh, travelers around the world. The number one answer worldwide is we check out the bathroom. Whether the obsession is with the little amenities, those bottles that we want to take home, uh, cleanliness, whatever it is, that's the, one of the, the first things we do. Number two and number three answer, by the way, for those of you that are curious, we check the bed, uh, the firmness, the, the, the mattress, and the view from uh, the window if there is one. And year after year in the survey, th those two and three tend to alternate uh, positions. But the number one is the room. And a few years ago, in one of my travels, I walked into uh, the bathroom, as I always do. And on the side of the bathtub, um, I found a rubber ducky. This is not the rubber ducky. I still have that one, but uh, this is mine that I bought afterwards uh, because it's an always reminder. Uh, yes, it does re resemble Superman. Um, but at first, my first thought was, why is there a rubber duck there? I felt like maybe somebody forgot it. I called downstairs because of what I do for a living. And I asked and they said, look, um, uh, sir, a lot of our, our, our travelers happen to be business travelers. We know you may have had a long day. Uh, we're hoping that if you feel like it, draw a bath, uh, you know, re remember simpler times when you were a child, relax, take a load off uh, and enjoy. And I thought, and, and there was a little note, by the way, on, on the duck's neck that said, you know, uh, enjoy simpler times. And it was signed from the hotel's management. Now, for that hotel, that duck probably cost them, what, 20, 25 cents to, 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 to distribute. And they know that people like me are going to steal this duck and bring it back home. It's peanuts. But what this did is it actually impressed and delighted me. It kind of, so this is kind of good. And there's a lot of examples that I've gone through over my travels of, of unique, little uniquenesses that hardly cost anything, but they impressed and delighted me. And I can tell you, um, these are memorable moments. I can remember every hotel experience that I had. And, I, and I, while I'm talking about hotel and hospitality, every business has the opportunity, and I would say the obligation, to look for what is going to impress and delight customers. Now, I will warn you though, that what impresses us and delights us today becomes an expectation of tomorrow. And that's why a differentiated customer experience is a moving target. I can tell you many, many years ago, when my younger years, I still recall the time when I checked into a hotel and they had left me a fruit basket in the room. I was a much younger fellow back then in my early twenties. And it was one of my earliest business trips. I felt like a rock star. It was a tiny fruit basket. In fact, I still remember calling my parents and saying, you're not going to believe what they left me. And there's a little note from the manager and so on. Today, I walk into a hotel room. There better be a fruit basket left for me because that's my expectation. It's my right, in fact. So our, what impressed and delighted me 20 years ago now um, is a simple expectation. And I look for well beyond that. All of this to say is I would urge you to think about, I call this concept ever since that first hotel experience that I had, I call it the duck factor. And I would urge you that as you launch your business, if you're in the early stages or even two or three years in, I would ask you to pause and think about what is your duck factor in your business? What is it that can continually impress and delight your, delight your customers for them to keep coming back? I think that's a very big question to ask yourself as you go through, be it the eight trends or beyond that, uh, the discover, develop, and deliver components that we talked about in the customer experience. And I'm going to leave you with this final remark. Uh, one of my favorite uh, women, God bless her soul, uh, Maya Angelou, who said, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And a differentiated customer experience gets exactly at the heart of that statement. And I truly hope that we can find that uh, together through your businesses as you look through that. Uh, look inwards and hopefully find a unique and, 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 and differentiated experience for your customers. Lorenzo, I'm going to pass it back on to you. That's excellent, Edward. Thank you so much. That last bit was very powerful. Um, I really appreciate that circle that you created with the three type of sort of expected and, 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 and how is the next level of, of, uh, of, of, of how you can, you know, get to the next level of this relationship with the with a client. There's a few good questions coming in. I encourage anybody that's having some other questions before we close. I, I have a question myself, um, Edward. Mm -hmm. This may be the, could be the, the million dollar question is, how risky or how advisable could it be to make customer service 
the center of your differentiator of who you are as a company in terms of your strategy, in terms of what you communicate out there to your clients? Making it the center would be difficult. And, and I'll explain in a minute why. I, I think it's an important part of the process and the measure. Um, and you have to be two things. One, you have to be honest uh, with yourself and, and take that feedback and do something about it. But on the second side, you need to be able to deliver exceptionally well. Because yeah. there's something that happens also from a psychological standpoint. When I see a, uh, a customer satisfaction survey um, and I mark something as midway or, or less, than, less than agreeable, um, this leaves an impression with me also. It kind of reminds me of the bad experience that I've had. So, I, and, but again, at sometimes at the same time, why, it's, why I say we have to be honest with ourselves is that it's a great part of the strategy to tell us, look, you know, we're doing something wrong and customers are recognizing it and they're telling us about it. How are we going to fix that? So I do think it plays an integral role, uh, but not the, the, not, not, not the, entire, uh, the entire strategy or, or the center of it for that matter. We're getting a few questions that relate to the balance scorecard. Um, anything else that we can give as a final comment on the balance scorecard? And maybe we could, we could leave a link on how to create a balance scorecard when we send a, uh, an email back to, to the people that attended the, the webinar? I think so. I, I think it's, look, it, it's a very good question. I'm glad somebody's asking and thinking about the measurement uh, of all of this. And that's where the balance scorecard comes in. Uh, the one interesting thing about balance scorecards is there is, no, uh, uh, there is no template in the sense that it's the same for everybody. Some of you here on the call are in the services industry. Some of you actually have product. Um, some of you are startups. Some of you are much more mature businesses. Um, and, and obviously at, at different levels and in, in interaction with the client, it might be virtual, it might be physical. Um, so I think it's really coming down and recognizing, um, as we said, commercial and operational are the obvious ones. Um, and, and those are easier and, and operational. I would also, that, that we use another word is efficiency. And there's so many things that can, I gave two or three examples for each one, but there's so many other measures that are there. Uh, but similarly, it's about that customer engagement or the customer measurement and the employee engagement that are so important to be part of that uh, because our unhappy employees, I can guarantee you, will impact your, your customers and you'll end up with unhappy customers. Uh, but you've got to sit down and recognize in the business what will, what will determine your level of success on a commercial basis, of course, the operational or efficiency basis, but then it comes down to the customers as well and recognize what it is that you want to measure and then subsequently what it is that you want to improve. Sandro is saying, if we take care of our people, they will take care of our business. Anything 100%. That you do, anything uh, you it, would want to improve in your company will be considered done. Beautiful. I, uh, th that is a wonderful way of putting it. Uh, I, will, I will put this in, a, in, in an, uh, my phrase that we use is, external service can never exceed internal service. You cannot have a fantastic experience outside when you've got a horrible experience inside or a mediocre one. It all starts within. You take care of your people, as Sandra said, it'll, you, they'll take care of your, your customers. Um, it's almost always as simple as that. Excellent. Uh, Sanya is asking today, one of our investors mentioned that our differentiator is only good if we build a moat, M-O-A-T, yeah. then we have to power it with velocity and scale. Can you share more on this, please? Interesting. Um, I'm not, I can understand the moat uh, analogy and, and, and kind of blocking our, our people out and there's that one entrance into the castle. Uh, however, I'll be honest, we, we've got I mean, big, big companies, big examples where uh, they, they've done the absolute opposite, where they haven't necessarily alienated themselves from their competition. On the contrary, uh, they, they've welcomed that. There was a very famous story a few years ago uh, with a department store where the customer came looking in for something. They didn't have it in stock. The customer was a little bit distraught. The employee called another, another competing department store, found out they have it, and told the customer. The customer, while they bought that because of necessity, they wrote back to management to say, I will never shop anywhere else. And next time, unless I'm, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm waiting for you and your staff because this was going above and beyond. Um, and I think that, you know, you know, that moat is not necessarily the case. However, on the second part of that statement, velocity and, and scalability, I think scale is the key. 
for many of us, we create these situations or these experiences, but they're not scalable. They're dependent on one individual. Uh, they're, not, they're, they're not replicable. That becomes a problem. And I do agree with that comment from your investor in the sense that, uh, Samia, you have to be able to make sure that the velocity is the speed to market and definitely the scalability, but without losing the essence of the customer experience or the, go the, the, the customer engagement that you have. Sadaf is saying, how can we apply this to something like e-commerce where the customer is a lot of unknown faces? Yeah, so again, um, today, a lot of platforms allow for that. I would find that e-commerce business people sometimes want to hear your story. Uh, and today, putting a video together takes nothing at all. Editing, it takes peanuts. It's, it's, it's stuff that we can all do and, and learn these skill sets. Um, it is amazing how, um, and again, so it, we're, I want to point out something from that comment, if, if assuming it was read correctly, um, is you know a lot of faceless people and, and so on online. The business should not be faceless. The customers can be, but that's okay. But we need to put a face to the business. We need to put a story to it, a video that tells the tale. Sometimes it's the entrepreneur. And sometimes if you've got one satisfied customer, it's the only customer you have, heck, do a video testimonial with them um, and put that on there or reenact it in an animated video, which you've got, again, tons of free uh, platforms out there. Don't make your business faceless. It's okay for the customer to be faceless until you get to know them and create that interaction and engage them beyond the e-commerce platform um, is when we have to reach out to them as a follow-up, uh, as a thank you, as a little gift, whatever it might be, anything that keeps that interaction and turns it from faceless to personal. And with the, the level of detail and information that you can get nowadays from, from the type of campaigns that you could do through digital, social media, you can... You can reach out to people by knowing their demographics, their age, uh, what they do, what kind of groups they like on internet, what phone they use. I mean, you're in a way pretty much also profiling who these customers are yeah. and you're uh, uh, sort of addressing the message according to the people that you are targeting, right? Very true, absolutely. And, and, and I, I think we, we've, we've made such strides in that area. Um, I don't wanna say that nobody has an excuse, but the reality is, uh, there's so much available out there. We, our, our jobs are becoming easier um, in, in engaging the customer, finding different ways. Uh, there's so much available and technology has obviously been a blessing in, in so many ways. Um, and and we, have to make, we have to take advantage of it. Excellent. Well, we're reaching the end of this webinar. Uh, I encourage everybody to keep on the conversation on our LinkedIn group that we have created. I don't know if anybody from my team there quickly can put the LinkedIn group and I encourage everybody to connect to ZZ Connect uh, platform, where is a platform that we uh, have a, at Creative Zone where entrepreneurs and startups connect with one another, share their stories, and we can uh, continue conver conversing over there. Uh, to everybody, we're gonna be sending an email with a full link of this video of today. Um, hopefully, Edward, I don't know if it's possible to get a copy of the presentation and we can send that out. And if you have a few other links that you're able to share, how to build balanced scorecards, anything else of value that we can share with our audience, it would be appreciated and um, uh, it would be great. Terrific, will do. Uh, Edward, thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, for sharing this with us today. We, we really appreciate it. My pleasure, Lorenzo. Thank you. And best of luck to everybody, all the participants that were on the webinar today. I, I truly wish you all the very best in the future. Thank you. And thank you to all the attendees for taking part of this webinar again. This is the seventh webinar of a, of a, of a group of 12 that we're doing. We look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, same time, 5 p.m. with another exciting topic. Thank you, everybody. See you again soon. Bye-bye.